Hello and welcome to my show, TikTok, where we talk about what makes successful people tick and what it took for them to pursue their passions, follow their dreams, and achieve their goals. The world and the powers that be underestimated and tried to silence this beautiful woman. But at age 23, this Filipina Italian model fearlessly spoke up and called out one of the most powerful sexual predators in her industry. Even if the outcome destroyed her at first, after a couple of years, she bravely risked it all again, which helped to finally bring him down. Today, she continues to speak out and fight for those who feel that they have no voice. We have her to thank for help. We have her to thank for helping start the momentum of the Me Too movement and for helping change the world. Mabuhay and benvenuta to Ambra Batilana Gutierrez. Hi, Ambra. Hi, Mircea. Thank you so much for the introduction. Super nice. <laughs> Thank you for waking up early in New York. How are you today? I'm, I'm very good. I'm very good. I was um, yeah trying to fix a little bit the Facebook situation. I'm not really good with these things, but um, no. I'm good. I'm very good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No problem. How are you? I'm okay. I see some of your paintings behind you. Uh, uh, I, yes. I read it. I love... You sold all your paintings. Is that right? No, it was, um, I put up three um, oh. up for charity and then, yeah, now they asking me more. So it's kind of like, I don't know, unbelievable for me to be doing that because it was always just my passion. So, I mean, well, I now. Think, I, think, I think you're seeing... very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you want to I mean, help raise funds for the frontliners is that right yeah that's the right thing yeah 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 I collaborate with this friend of mine in, in New York and so like he said okay let's try to put up like some of your paintings for for the, this cause so I said okay let's see and it worked out well <laughs> I, was, I wasn't right. like believing it yeah when they told me it was like super shocked and, um, and then yeah and you want to try photography next, right? You have a very good eye. <laughs> I, 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 well, um, yeah, maybe soon, not yet. I, I enjoy more the paintings and yeah, let's see for photography, maybe soon. <laughs> right. Now I, I, never... I stay on the other side of, of the camera still. I still have to learn. <laughs> well, you're doing a good job, even if you're just a beginner. So I'll go right to the most important question that everybody wants to ask. Ambra, yeah. how did you become so brave? I mean, you were literally, well, you were figuratively a little David going against Goliath. How do you develop that kind of courage? Was it mm. uh, from your childhood or I to be so brave? I don't know, like it feels that uh, since I was a kid, even just watching cartoons where there was injustice um, really made me feel angry, you know? Like I always felt like when I was little that I was helpless, that I couldn't do things uh, because I was a child. And so, I don't know, growing up, I always promised myself like, I don't want these things to happen, you know, in, in my world, in my life. I don't want these things to, you know, I want the, the, the good people to win always, right. you know, like, like in the movies. And right. um, so when, yeah, like this encounter happened, unfortunately, with this person, I mean, I, I promised myself that I would always do what was right. And, and I don't know where it came from, maybe from God, maybe from, I don't know, like something from within, uh, right. inside me, like it really gave me the, the push to, to continue like this battle. It was, it was interesting to see, but like, it, when I look back, I feel like, I don't know, it, it wasn't even a decision. It was something that really just came up naturally. Like I needed to do what was right. So Right. Yeah. Could it have something to do with the fact that, and you've been open about this, uh, you grew up in a home where there was domestic violence, and you yeah. were often, when your father would beat up your mother, 
and you would try to uh, fight back, he would beat you up as well. Do you think this yeah, is something that was you yeah, being brave? Th that's the help helpless, let's say, feeling that I had when I was growing up. And um, yeah, not being able to do anything because... Yeah, I was still very little. It made me always so mad. And yeah, then whatever, growing up, I, I learned a lot of things. I was able to, to fight back, let's say. And yeah, then my father left and, and it was a better situation. But I always felt like, you know, this kind of things should never happen. And, and there is always... A solution to it and that soon or later is going to be resolved so probably also that was the way I feel that people that go through pain always have this sort of like strength that they developed within and and yeah I mean I saw it a lot when I moved to the Philippines that Filipino has this type of you know strength inside um because you know almost everyone is going through something. So right. it's kind of like, it's the culture of the strength that you have inside, like the fighting spirit of Filipino, I guess. <laughs> of the the Filipino. never, yeah, never giving up type, yeah. And your, your mother is Filipina, right? Would you say yes, she's a very she strong is. woman? Oh yeah, absolutely. She is, she's very, very sensitive and kind. Um, but in the same time, very strong and resilient and she never stopped in things, you know, like she always resolved the situations and, and yeah, that's, that's the way of saying it. Like when you see her, she's very, uh, kind, but in the same time she could take down a mountain, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, well, you, I guess you inherited from her because you did take down a mountain. Uh, how young <laughs> were you when you started supporting your family? You were still a teenager? Um, I was about 14 years old when I started modeling. So, um, of course, I was studying because I really love to, to study, to learn. And I think that school is the most important thing that you could pursue. Uh, but in the same time, I was doing like little gigs of work um, in my city and in Milan, that is two hours from where I was born in Torino. So, yeah, I mean, it was very good. I mean, I'm, I'm very uh, hyperactive as a person. I always want to do many things at the same time. So studying and working was never like difficult for me. Um, but it came out in the right time, let's say, like, it was good because I, I wanted to help out family. And so, yeah, like, that's how it happened. And, and then modeling became my passion. So, of course, I pursued it and I left Italy and then got to, to the United States. Yes, soon. Yes, so, but before, before that, at the age of 18, you already bravely spoke out against and testified for, again, in yeah. the case of Prime Minister Berlusconi, right? Yes. And um, you were just a teenager. Yeah, I was 18. Um, it happened very casually, let's say. Um, I had this agent at a time that was representing me for the selection of Miss Italy. You know, it was, it was taking me around. And I was trusting him at the end, like, you know, he got me castings and stuff, uh, as any agent does. Then suddenly it happened that one time with another colleague of mine from Miss Italy, um, he said that he was driving us to some party to celebrate our victory, whatever. Um, then we got to this mansion and he left us there saying that he was going to get a friend or something. And, and we ended up being in this mansion of, um, of the ex-prime minister of Italy, where he was doing weird parties with a lot of women that were celebrities in Italy, that, were, that they are still celebrities in Italy. 
So it's kind of like weird to see people that you grew up watching in TV wow. then yeah. Right. Yeah, doing like weird sex parties. <laughs> so we ended up there. Um, we left. Um, we, we escaped, let's say. And suddenly my life um, changed completely because like not participating to this type of parties, let's say, um, put me in a situation where people were against me, let's say. Right. Because in the news, yeah, in the news, they put up my name and my other friend name that we were both 18 years old um, on the front pages uh, of you know, the main news outlet has, we were escorts or we were, um, you know, those girls participating to these sex parties that it wasn't true. Right. So yeah. we ended up there uh, because of this agent and we left without getting any sort of work opportunity or anything because of course we didn't participate to this party. And then we were in the news because what happened is that a 16 year old girl uh, yeah. at the time uh, sued Berlusconi saying that he uh, yeah, pushed prostitution uh, to her when she was 16 years old. And because of that, the police was doing investigations and, and then our name my name and my friend name came out in the news because we went there for two hours of our life oh, wow. and it wasn't even for our <laughs> choice but anyway right. it started it started this huge mess um even before I finished my school so I was 18 and still going to school I had paparazzi following me oh, um wow. yeah I I had a mess in my life like my life was destroyed even before starting and, but, and yeah long very, story short and you very bravely testified I mean for yeah an because year old. yeah I I wanted to have the truth coming out because people yeah. were saying things that weren't true and yeah I wanted to to clarify the situation and it took a very long time actually the trial is still open in Italy oh, wow. and it's yeah. yeah it's nine nine years ten years almost um right because it's it's there is a lot of layers to it like right. during the trial there were a lot of people that were um paid out to lie and all these kind of things so it's very long but i'm still battling <laughs> i'm I still know. fighting and, let's say and then you go to new york at 23 and then you get assaulted yeah, yeah actually i was 22 yeah when i got there okay yeah, like and, I, st I kept going with my life. I kept following my dreams. I changed my name. I used my mom's surname and I moved to London. When uh, I got to London, I started modeling and it was very well going. And after that, um, I went to Paris and then to, to the US. And yeah, when I was 22, I got to New York. It was, you know, amazing for me. Like, it was a dream coming true. I would never thought of because as I told you, like my reputation was destroyed and I thought, okay, that's it. Like I could never do anything. And, and suddenly, yeah, I, I go out with my, with my um, agency for, for a theater show. I was with other girls of, of my agency and my agent. And um, yeah, we, we went to watch this beautiful beautiful show and at the end there was a party after in the same place and there is there was a lot of people um i remember a lot of models and there was a vip aria on on the top of this this uh this place and we went there so i was watching myself around i wasn't speaking so well english because i learned around when i was 20 years old and and so I was curious to just observe things. And at one point I felt like there was a person staring at me from far. And, and yeah, he kept staring and kept staring. And at one point he came towards me. And, and then he said, hey, hi, what is your name? And I said, oh, my name is Amber. 
And then he said, oh, you know, you remind me a lot of this actress, uh, Mila Kunis. Do you know, do you know her? And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. <laughs> because like <laughs> at a time, yeah, at a time I, I didn't know much about yeah. American, you know, right. um, people because it was only two years that I was traveling the world or something. And um and then um, he kept talking and he asked who was my agent or my agency. So I introduced him to, to my agent that was like close by me because I didn't want to stay far from him. And they start talking in front of me and he said, oh, you know, uh, I, I think Amber has a big potential for this project that I have. And um, I would love her to, to try to, to do a casting for it. And so my agent was like, yes, sure, absolutely. Um, this is my business card. So in front of me, in three minutes conversation, they exchanged business cards and this person left. At one point, um, my agent, super excited, talked to me and he said, oh, Amber, do you know, do you know who's this person? Do you know who this person is? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> and he answered, yeah, well, you know, the show that we had just watched, uh, I said, yeah, it was beautiful. And he said, yeah, he's the producer of it. He did the show. And in my mind, I said, wow, okay, nice. But also, I'm not an actress. And right. I, never, I don't do theater. So I was like, okay, good, nice. I mean, right. someone in whatever this business wanted to, to try to you know, engage me for, for work and whatever. So that night I went out with my friends and whatever, this is the story of that night. And then in the next day, I, I woke up and, um, and I had two castings for that day. So I get ready. It was end of March. So it was very cold in New York and I, wear like very tight um, tights, stockings, mm -hmm. and uh, in a dress. So then I go out to the first casting and it was probably 10 in the morning. Then I went to the second one, probably midday. And then I got a call from my agent and, and my agent is super excited. He's like, Amber, Amber, you have an extra casting today. You have an extra casting today. And I said, oh, okay, great. And he said, you know, the person of yesterday, um, this person wants to see you in, uh, in his office. Go to the casting, go to the casting. And the casting was around 5, 5 p.m. So it was still daytime, you know. I never thought of anything bad. So right. Right. I, I go to eat. In a certain point, I, I go to the casting. It was in this Tribeca Film Center office, so proper place. I go to the reception, give my documents. They uh, escorted me upstairs to the third floor, and I go through a lot of desks of people working. So there, are, there are actually a lot of people in the office, right? It's not just yeah, you. Yeah, a lot of people working. And, and then I keep going till this waiting room and, and I sit there in the sofa. So I'm there and the secretary told me to wait and she put up some, some video uh, on the TV. And it was like a lot of trailers for different movies. So I was watching and I recognized a few of them. And I'm like, oh, wow, nice. There was Kill Bill, Paddington, or others. And, and I'm like, oh, nice. And then when the movie's finished, um, yeah, he got into the room. And, and then again, he started to say, oh, Amber, I'm so glad to see you. Um, like, I'm really happy that you're here. And, and I said, oh, nice to see you again. And, and he kept talking about how I remind him of Mila Kunis <laughs> and that I would be a great actress if he would lead me to. And it was like three minutes conversation again. And he was sitting down close to me. 
And, and then I said, okay, this is my book because it kept talking. He wanted to talk and I'm like, not yeah. really a good fan <laughs> of talking. I really don't like talking. And, and so like I gave my book and he was watching my photos. Then he stopped to one of the lingerie pictures and, uh, and he asked me, oh, is, is your breast real? And, wow. and I watched him weirdly and I said, yes. And so I don't know how, like in a matter of one little second, not even, his hands were on my breast. Wow. And I was shocked. Like the first reaction was freezing. Like I didn't know if I had to do something, but like my body couldn't react. And, and then he started asking me to kiss him. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't do these things with people I don't know. And yeah, I mean, like he, he then pushed back and said, oh yeah, no, I, I understand, absolutely, I understand. Uh, maybe if we meet up tonight, we get a drink and stuff. And, and I don't know, I, I, I don't remember even if I answered to him or I right, said whatever. Right. Yeah, and, and then the secretary came in and said, yeah, um, Amber, follow me. I'm gonna send you the tickets for tonight, this and that. I have your email. Um, and it was not very clear how I got out of there, but I went to the restroom. Um, I went to the restroom, put my hands under the cold water because I felt like I was going to faint or something. Of course. So yeah, no, after that, I went um, to the elevator and I started to panic. I was calling my agent and I was trying to reach him out. Uh, but that day he left early the office. So I called someone else of the office and, and I started saying like, hey, hey, something happened. I, I need to talk to someone, something happened. I was at the casting and this and that. So I got to my agency and yeah, when I got there, I started to cry and I think, think yeah I cried for like an hour I was trying to understand the situation and I was thinking why everything to me you know what did like the was... agent say what did the agent say yeah well he first was listening to all my story because I, I don't think he knew about what happened in Italy and, and I was saying, like, why everything is happening to me? Why all these things happen to me? Right, and, right. And then, like, I told him, like, this person touched me, assaulted me in his, in his office. And, and he's like, what? what? How? Like, what happened? And so I told him. And then I said, I, I need to go to the police. And he watched me and said... Amber, this person, this person is super powerful. You're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your career. You're going to lose all the things you have. And I don't know why, but I'm oh, sorry. Are you there? Sorry. Yes, yes, and yes. Go on. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but um, I, don't, I felt inside that I needed to go to the police. And so I did. And... Um, yeah, what happened next is that the police, of course, wanted to know um, much more of, right. of the story that I was saying because, and like, they how said, can you? And they said again, right? Yeah, like when I got to the to the police window, um, and I said like his name, uh, this person answered with again, and and so when I. When I heard that, I, I thought, why again? Like this happened before. And so like in my mind, as I was thinking, maybe this happened to someone younger than me. Maybe this happened worse to somebody right, else, right, you know? Right. So like I couldn't stop that thinking. And I promised myself that I would have done everything possible, you know, to, to get this person um, into justice. And uh, yeah, so what happened next is that that night um, he called me because 
he was waiting for me to go to this date that he thought he was having with me. And, yeah. and I, I wasn't there, of course. And he was very mad at the phone. And he didn't know I was with the police. Um, so the police so he was could talking. hear the call. Yeah. So he was talking and, and he was saying like, how you're not here. I gave you the ticket. They're very expensive. Um, like you should have been here. I was waiting for you and all these kind of things. And then he told me about what happened in the office. Like, oh yeah, you look beautiful. Like your breast feels beautiful, all these type of things. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> and the, the police was there recording. So I thought, okay, that's it. They got him, you know, they, he assaulted right. me. That's it. So then instead, um, after the conversation was down, uh, I remember this police woman watched me um, and said, Amber, could you do something for us? And, and I said, yeah, absolutely, anything. And she said, would you meet him tomorrow and wear a wire? And I said, oh, yes, absolutely. Wow, you know? so brave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I always wanted to, to work for like, you know, special agent or CIA or whatever oh, wow. like growing up. Yeah, so no I was fear. like yeah and I was like okay cool like I want to do this like I want to turn into reality what is you know something I wanted to do and so the next day I met him and uh, I was at this theater show um, and then his driver took me to a hotel to a lobby hotel there was a bar so we were there and I remember there was like the police undercover around me and oh. he arrived and he started to talk and talk and talk. Were you afraid? About... Were you afraid? Were you like super nervous or just cool? You know what? Like, I think in my mind, because I thought about the fact that he would do that again to someone else, it just gave me really a sense of being angry wow. that, right. yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't even like, yeah feel that I was in fear or something so yeah I had this wire and he started talking and he talked of how he made famous a lot of actresses in Hollywood and that they were <laughs> their like girlfriends or something and okay. and I was saying like oh okay but I'm not an actress I don't know how to act I'm sorry and and I was playing a little dumb like I wanted to, you know, made him talk. So I was like, oh, really? But I don't know this and that. Like, how is it that? And, you know, so he was like, yeah, I explain you this and this. You know, it works this way and that way. And I can teach you. And I'm like, oh, wow, you're so nice. And this and that. And so, like, then he started to, to say out of nowhere, oh, let's go upstairs. I need to get ready for this event. And I'm like, oh, but uh, can I wait here? <laughs> you know, he's like, no, 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 it's gonna be five seconds, five minutes. Just come upstairs. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I was watching myself around, and I saw the police people, you know, there, and I was trying to talk with my eyes, and and so I followed him. So we got to the elevator first on the second floor. And then we were walking on this hallway. And at one point, because I left my jacket downstairs has, you know, like for safety, right. um, I told him like, oh no, I forgot my jacket, it's downstairs. It's very important. It's like, oh no, I'm gonna send someone to get it. And I'm like, no, no, there's something very important in it. So I left and he starts following me. I got my jacket and then again, um, I watched the police because the first time they didn't follow me. And yeah, the second time, again, he tried to take me to, to his room. Right. So yeah, I followed him and uh, we are in this hallway. And yeah, I mean, he almost got to the room and someone came out from nowhere, out of nowhere and started to say, 
oh, hello, Mr. Weinstein. This is blah, blah, blah from TMZ. Uh, I would like oh. to know who's the lady with you. So I realized that was one of the police people. Oh, oh my God. And, um, <laughs> and I felt like, okay, good, I'm safe. Um, I started to say things like, oh, who is this person? Why wants to know my name? Right. <laughs> and, um, and then he said, no, it's nobody. He's not supposed to be here. It's very weird that he's here. Um, and I said, oh, okay, but why wants to know my name? Maybe he thinks I'm famous. And he's like, no, 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 just follow me. So we went downstairs and, and that's when the scary part started because I followed him and I don't know, I thought that the police would arrest him or something. And right. instead he took me outside from, from the building. And when I was outside, there was another guy, very tall, like a bodyguard type that was with us. And yeah, at one point I was there following them, trying to wash my back to see if someone was with us like the police and I didn't see anybody but I kept going so I followed him and his bodyguard to um, an entrance service entrance of this hotel so then there was an elevator and in this elevator there was me him and this bodyguard so my heart started to really really like wow <laughs> pound so i was going upstairs and i was trying to communicate with the police because it wasn't directly connected to this mic and i was writing them on my phone saying it's taking me somewhere where are you guys and there was no connection because what? we went <laughs> yeah we went up to the penthouse um to the penthouse floor so there, then it was only me and him and nobody knew where I was. Oh my gosh. So at that point, I started to, to be nervous. And he said, get into the room, get into the room. I'm just going to get, a, I'm just going to shower and, and then we go. And, and I said, oh, uh, I'm sorry, but like, I don't feel comfortable. And and he's like, no, just five minutes, sit down, just five minutes. I swear, I'm not going to do anything to you. And I kept saying, like, why, why did you touch my breasts yesterday? And this type of things. Um, and he said, oh, come on, I'm used to that. And I'm like, I'm, you're used to that? <laughs> like, that moment, I was like, okay, this is for sure something that he does a yeah, lot. Yeah, we got him, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, okay, I got you. And then he started to say things like, oh, I swear on my children, I'm not touching you, these kind of things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be out for sure. And he's going to be so destroyed, you know. I already knew it in my mind. Um, but were, so were you not afraid because it's only you and him in the room? And there's no police? Mm, no, like... I, I, I didn't get into the room. I was oh, at the door. Where were you? Oh, at the door. Okay. At the door of the room. And um, yeah, like at one point, I never got close to him. I never wanted to get close to him. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving. So I turned my back and I took the elevator down. And yeah, he followed me. Um, again <laughs> like wow. he was so obsessed I don't know what was wrong with it but uh, yeah so like I got there to the to the bar again and he started talking to me again like to try to maybe I don't know analyze me understand me or something and I said I'm sorry I'm going to the restroom and I went to the restroom and that was like my um, code for saying to the police that's enough for me you right, know? right, right. So I, I thought that they took him away. So I was so happy. And I said, okay, I have also the, the recordings, you know, because yeah. they, they told me to record also my phone. So okay. I had those recordings. So you had a back, backup recording. Yeah. And I sent that to five different emails that I had at the time okay. uh, to save it. So right. that's it. It was done for me. But then what happened next 
is that suddenly, I don't know how, I was uh, again all over the news. Right, but this because time. It tried to destroy you by uh, yes. digging up dirt on you, right? And then the exactly. case was dismissed. Yeah, like, yeah, he, he was powerful. He could write whatever on the news. He wrote that I asked for a movie role. He wrote that I had um, a boyfriend that was like my sugar daddy. He wrote right. whatever things like that were, I don't know, absolutely, you know, not, not even possible to, to write. And I and was then suddenly... like, okay. Yeah, the, the DA, um, the district attorney interviewed yeah. me and, and started to ask me questions like, oh, were you ever a prostitute in Italy? Right, and I'm like, right. what, sorry? And, and she was asking me all of these questions and I kept telling her, did you hear these recordings? Like he assaulted me and he's saying it on these recordings. <laughs> like, yeah. I, so I was she, going to tell she her. She questioned you as if you were the criminal and not the victim. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. She pushed me like I was, I was the criminal. And I kept saying like, because my English wasn't so perfect, but I understood what was happening. You know, I, I really understood that they were trying to, to put me on a bad light. And I was right. like, okay, yeah, this, this is not right. Um, so I left this meeting and the next day, uh, they were saying how they were not criminally charge him. And I'm like, right. what? Oh, and it was on the news. Like it, they didn't even call me. It was in the news because there was like a week of like battles between the good new like newspaper that were helping me and the bad newspaper that he was paying you know so, so suddenly you're all over the papers again in your lingerie all over. yes all over war wild has the italian model that was a blackmailer and a liar and all these kind of things that i mean i just did what was right and whatever right. he was powerful at the time so what happened next is that I was trying to get those recordings out. Like I was so, so, so focused on that, but I didn't know who to trust, okay? Because I didn't want to say that I had those recordings. Yes. So I was trying to, to find some right journalist or some right person. And at the time I didn't know many people. I just got to New York since three weeks. So... I was like, oh gosh, it's so difficult. And I was praying God every single day saying like, lead me to the right situation. What should I do? So then what happened next is that my lawyers and their lawyers trying to shut me up. So they were proposing me money, um, a lot of money. And I kept saying, no, sorry. I, I don't want to sign anything. And again, the next day, they were giving me even more money and saying, um, yeah, if you sign this, everything is going to go away. Like, this is going to be a result. And inside me, I kept thinking, what is going to be, like, who is going to be the next? You know, like, I, oh, I felt that, like, I couldn't do it. Like, I was like, no. And then, like, one day, my brother called me from Italy and he said, oh, Amber, there is somebody that is asking about you um, here at my job. And I'm like, Who, who is this? And he said, oh, is it like a journalist or somebody? He, he asked me if I'm your brother. And I said, okay, so please just, just go home and stay home. Okay. I, I don't know, but like, I start feeling very, very uncomfortable. Right. Um, I, I would never think that somebody would find my family. So in Italy, <laughs> right. And, and I got scared. So, so then of course I decided to sign an NDA because yes. I won't, I didn't want to put on risk anybody of my and family part, of course part of the nda's requirement was that you destroy all the evidence right and you signed it but yes. you did not 
exactly i don't know why like i think that every time someone think i'm stupid i want to show them that i'm not <laughs> so right let's say that um yeah those this nda when i signed um the day before they asked me to give all my devices my computer my phone my email passwords everything to this um i don't know like company that would destroy everything so i gave it to them but then i started to play dumb again saying that i forgot one of the passwords from this email that was italian and so i had to call the company when they would open the next day and and so i tricked them to to think that i didn't remember this um this email password right and so what i right. did um i went to a friend's place i used her computer and i opened the email and downloaded the files uh without being online so that okay. they would not see that i opened the email so yeah i did that and uh, and i called my i called my lawyer and uh and i told him like oh hey i, I got the password is this one is this one uh so he he said oh okay great i'm going to send it to them so he sent the the password and i remember i was watching this computer of my friend for 2 hours i was staring at it oh. <laughs> <laughs> i was just <laughs> waiting you know to know what was going to happen you know i was praying and i'm like i was i was just like if this works you know like it's going to be good you know so then they called me up 2 hours later and and he said yeah amber it's all good you can come get your stuff and i was like yes <laughs> you know like, <laughs> and you were so you I, were not afraid to like go against the nda and all the repercussions that might happen like no, so i didn't care you never thought of that you didn't care i i i didn't care i really didn't care i don't know like i i thought that was right and it was not going to to happen that way right so, but it didn't end there right you lost a lot of work so oh, yeah i nobody couldn't to book you No, what happened is that <laughs> um I went into depression and I started to eat a lot, like I gained oh. probably 30 pounds or something like that. Yeah, when I got to the Philippines, um a lot of people probably remember me when I was chubby <laughs> because <laughs> I, I was... don't remember you that way. <laughs> yeah, I think I we mean... met in 2016 for cause yeah, and I, I, I was, had no I was idea that, that, yeah yeah there I, I was already fine yeah okay i yeah. had no idea what you had gone through and nobody knew right yeah but yeah you, but, but you were depressed but mm -hmm. then you said yeah. you said you can bend me but you cannot break me oh 100% were you, were you planning to release the tape someday or Yeah, 100%. I was still searching someone I could trust. Um one second that I need to just plug because it's finishing right. the battery one second. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. And so At which point did you meet Ronan Farrell? Was it around after you had modeled in Manila? Yes. You went back to I, New York. So what happened next is that um I yeah, I was in the Philippines to try to recover from my depression because I felt that yeah, um in the philippines i could be happy and it actually happened so thanks a lot <laughs> and uh i recovered yeah i recovered from my depression and and when i felt stronger you know that i started to work out to lose weight to to feel better mentally i went back to new york 
also because I finished a relationship that like it wasn't really good and I came to New York to my best friend and when I got there suddenly it was very weird like because at the start um what happened is that nobody wanted to talk to me when all this news um happened back in 2015 everybody was afraid of me so yes. i couldn't get to restaurants i couldn't go to clubs i couldn't like you know meet people because uh, nobody wanted me close to them only my my best friend um wow. andrea maybe you met him wow. Wow. he was the only person that was with me all the time like he didn't care because he knew what was the, the truth so like then um, I got back there, I was staying with Andrea and um, suddenly three weeks or two weeks later that I got to New York, Ron and Faro reached out to me. <laughs> okay. How did he find me? He got my number from, from my lawyer, I think. Like my, yeah, my lawyer gave him my number to, lawyer that I had before and and he called me and I don't know I was confused because my lawyer always told me like don't ever talk to nobody and and he gave me this number and I was like okay that's weird like why have you given me a journalist number and so I don't know I felt like it was right the right time and I started to trust him so of course very very silent subtle like I met him somewhere I talked to him I met him somewhere else and I talked again and and then I got to trust at the, him at the back of your mind were you suspicious that he was under Harvey Weinstein I could have thought of but I don't know why like something inside me told me he's good you know okay. like I have these things about people I can feel when someone is good or is not good it's like a sixth sense I don't know like I I, I feel it and right. um, I don't know it, 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 like it took probably eight months um, to really trust and everything and and then I said you know I, I can't really help you because he was telling me how he was investigating about this situation and that other yes. women were uh, raped by this person. Yes. yes. And I said, what do you mean raped? Like, and he told me like, yes, this happened, this happened with this other actress and this other actress. And I don't know, I was really, really angry. Um, and, and I told him like, listen, I have something that can really help you. And and then I, I made him listen to these recordings. So it was like super, super astonished, surprised. Sure. Like, right. He said, Amber, we, we got him. And I'm like, right. yeah, I know. And thank you for being here because otherwise <laughs> I would never know how to do it. So yeah, we started to collaborate into releasing those recordings because I told him like I don't want my names to come out if possible so he said that he got those recordings from police and <laughs> all these kind of things and suddenly the police doesn't even have those recordings so I'm thankfully um, yeah really glad that I kept them and yeah then the 11th of October 2017 those recordings were released and right. right I was free I was free again <laughs> I got my names back I got right. work so, back so he published this in the New Yorker article but you yes. did come out like the picture of the under the headline was your face and your whole story and you came out how come what made you change your mind initially you said you didn't want your name but then when it no, he, he was writing about me as a third person. Like he would never say oh. Amber said this. Oh. I told him like, don't ever say I gave you those recordings or, oh. Oh. or things right. like that, right. you know, because of course I wanted to have my family safe and all of these course. things first. So yeah, this was the, the thing that I told him like to, to do for me. 
And um, yeah, so what happened next is that suddenly, as I knew, I could work again. Um, wow. People were calling me a hero. Um, yeah. I, I got big gigs coming my way. And I was just even sad Victoria's that- Even Secret, right? Even Victoria's Secret. Yeah, even Victoria's Secret that I would never thought of, of, you know, imagine like my life is completely destroyed. I'm thinking about giving up modeling, that I can never do anything anymore. And, and then suddenly Victoria's Secret cast 15 models in my agency and they picked me. And I'm like, oh, wow, is this real? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Like, I, I was like, it's impossible, you know, all my luck is coming out now. And right. I was sad because I had the casting for Victoria's Secret the week of what happy, happened with Harvey Weinstein. Oh. So, yeah, back then I already had a casting with them and I was 22. Wow. And I felt like I had to choose back then right. if to go against this person or to try to, you know, follow my dreams. Right. And of course I, I gave up on, on the right. career or whatever, but I want to demonstrate myself that I could have got it, you know? So right. like <laughs> then in, in 2018, I, I did it and, and I was so happy about it. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I saw that I was working again and everything and also like, um, doing other things, you know, like whatever comes in my way in my mind right now, I'm able to to realize it. You know, I don't have any obstacle because before I had to start from minus 100, right. you know, when right. I had to do something. And you and lost now, all those years in your career. And so finally, when he was... Yeah, three years, it's a long time. When he was pronounced guilty, you cried and you said... It's a dream come true. Yeah, I was through? waiting for it. <sighs> it's hard because like they sentenced him in New York with the same people that didn't handle my case well. So they were avoiding me still right now. Wow. They didn't want me to testify in New York and what is weird is that I'm going to testify in LA when the case is going to open there. Okay. So it's like not admitting their fault. And it really bothers me, you know, because if they didn't do a good job with me, um, probably they would not do a good job then in the future. So I hope that something like that is not going to happen again. And they have to change the people that, you know, works in the DA. So yeah, I mean, hearing that it was sentenced 23 years, it was like, wow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, yeah, like that year I was turning 23 and I felt like, wow, he destroyed my life at 23. Yeah, he stole your life at 23, <laughs> right? Yeah. And this, and this uh, prompted you to help push the Adult Survivors Act. Can you explain more about it? Yes, so I'm working with organization in New York, I'm the spokesperson for them. They're a nonprofit that works with victims of abuse of any type. And what they're doing right now, after the Me Too started, they're trying to um, put up a law that would allow every victim of sexual assault and abuse to reopen their civil case for a year. So they're trying to pass this year a um, window where like people that were assaulted even like outside the statute of limitations. So for example, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right, right. and they have the proof and everything, they can go and sue their you know, uh, right. abuser. Because what happened is that many times when a victim of abuse or you know, assault on anything, um, they don't come out to tell right what happened because they're afraid to lose everything like happened to me or right. they're afraid for their life or their family life and anything. But when years goes by and you're maybe feeling ready for it, there is a statute of limitation that then doesn't allow you to go against this person anymore. And we're trying to 
to give the time again to these people to adjust their their life because for me for example okay i lost three years of my life okay but for many people maybe it was 10 years or more so i would like to see them getting their justice because with me like i got my justice after you know these five years (laughs) but like I am getting my life back and anything and I would want anybody else to feel like, you know, they, right. they got but their justice. Many people don't understand and say, well, why didn't they report the person right away? Why did they have to wait so many years? But they don't understand the psychological the trauma. trauma. Yeah, the it trauma was- like of people, they, some people cannot ever get back to what they were before you know like i'm lucky because i said i was just assaulted but like i didn't know how i could have react if this person would have gone far you know so i i thank god every single day for you know keeping me protected and everything another outcome of uh what happened to you is your partnership with model alliance in new york where you yes. help pressure the fashion industry to make changes in the way things work to protect models from 100%. abuse and mistreatment. I mean, when I look back on my modeling days and think of all the castings I got sent to and all the potentially dangerous situations that could yeah. have happened from your story, I feel like, wow, models really have no protection because how are they ever going to know if a place that they're being sent to is safe or not? Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, this is what what happens is models are really, really treated like the like lower part of the, the chain in yes. the in fashion industry. The food say. chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, especially if you're a model that is just starting and it's very young. Uh, so what Model Alliance is doing is helping uh, to put up some rules for the agency and clients and photographers and whoever works in the industry for having a more safe environment for models. And yeah, trying to help them also with um, different things as like the rights or how to get paid from agency when they don't pay. Um, yeah, the health insurance and all these type of things, like it's, they, they help them to, you know, like teach. Right. Um, and also, of course, to actively giving help for if ever a case of, of abuse and assault happened uh, right. with them. And yeah, we're working uh, to push this respect program that um, it's about um, putting like a set of rules and law between the models and the clients and all of these uh, people in the industry where they sign that they respect, right. you know, for like the models. So right. it's very hard to to be accomplished because a lot of people don't want to be starting. Right. But I feel that it's something that it must be done. And right. also because, you know, what happened with the situation of Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein uh, with Victoria's Secret, yes. like it's something unbelievable that you know there is proof of models um that you know very young age and anything being promised to become uh, models for Victoria's secret and all these kind of things um to be tricked to have sex with very old um powerful right. people and, and so I, and i think things like that should not happen progress in la i think you posted something about uh, uh, yeah, they they in LA in in California they're very progressive. They they really help like um, yeah they, they they engage very easily into the change. New York City is still a little tricky. I don't know why, <laughs> but okay. I yeah I feel that yeah Los Angeles it's 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 doing well, and and I hope they're gonna do it in in New York soon. Also, right. because, for example, I feel that any underage model that is under 18 years old, they should never be in New York. Like, it's too rough on their for own, them. right? On their own without parental guidance. Exactly. They, yes, right. they have to be having parents with them yes. because 
New York City, it's it's hard. It's hard even for me that I'm 28 right now. Like it's not an easy place. And so, yeah, first finish your study. And then <laughs> if you <laughs> want to really pursue this, yes. do it. You have time. Like I lost three years and I still am able to do it. So don't rush your time. Right, right. So you're also an advocate for sex positivity for those who don't understand can you kind of explain what this means for example you have a very beautiful and sexy instagram feed because obviously you're very proud of your body you embrace your sexuality you flaunt your body i would flaunt my body too if it looked like yours <laughs> but, but you're then, beautiful nurse yeah <laughs> but this has been taken against you before right like they'll put pictures yes. of you in your lingerie and say Maybe you deserve it because that's what you were wearing and other mm -hmm. things that they say that encourage rape culture. So mm -hmm. for people who judge your feed and say, well, look at her. She's hardly wearing any clothes. Maybe they say uh, she's kind of self, uh, kind of putting herself up for objectification for men. What mm -hmm. do you want to tell them? And what is your stand in this? Especially about yeah. like, Embracing so, sexuality. Uh, yeah, 100%. I, I could say that I actually was saved by the fact that I'm very empowered with my sensuality, with my being. I know right. who I am and I embrace it. So I was saved because I knew what I didn't want, what I didn't want with sex when I don't want sex. And so like I'm able to to go against it, you know? Because right. a woman, I feel that is not really um, feeling comfortable with this matter, that is not really embracing what she wants and what she likes, is not going to be able to to exteriorate, like exter externate. I don't know how you say it. Sorry, to to um, externalize. Impress, externalize uh, thank right. you <laughs> to externalize what she really wants and and tell it to someone so in a moment that yeah i am very um sensual in my instagram i do a lot of lingerie and a lot of bikini uh work as a model because i am a bikini and lingerie model but it's also part of who I am. Like right. I love wearing heels, I love wearing right. skirts, I love right. being a woman. And in the same time, like I could say that abuse of power from these men towards me was something for them to prove a point. Because right. trust me, when I'm in a club or when I'm somewhere, there is no man that comes up to me trying to do something like that. Because I right. have a, a strong, um, like image of me as someone that doesn't want this type of attention. I right. know right. how to act, how to, you know, respond to this type of ways. So men don't come up to me trying to assault me. Right. Like even if I'm wearing a skirt, you know? Right. And so like sex positivity for me, it's like, um, yeah, it's that. It's about not being afraid of sex and understand it. And knowing that as a woman, you are just having the same exact um, uh, way that men has with with sex, like they right. they're in the same level. Okay, yes, so yes. I'm pushing for that. I'm pushing for having women um, empowered and knowing what they want, as a man knows what he wants. And exactly. so, like that, we could push for change, for right. for a more respectful way of treating women, to not be judging them for not, you know, being proper and not yes. being like, you know, all like it's the whole um, slut shaming, slut shaming thing, right? Exactly. Many many Filipinas say they're say they're conservative, but and they're afraid to embrace their sexuality or even acknowledge that. Women are sexual beings and sexuality is a valid, healthy human biological function. And sometimes yes. their denial of this leads to problems like sexual dysfunction in relationships or even uh, eats at their self-esteem. What do you want oh, to yeah. tell them to help overcome this denial or this fear of their own sexuality? Yeah, like... Um 
may research right now everybody has the power to have in their hands a phone and and to be asking questions constantly about these matters like everybody's the same like every single person has the same thought as you have and so if you are curious and wanted to know about a matter um, especially in how to be more confident with yourself and knowing like you know how to to really navigate sex into the positive way like just ask questions on google <laughs> you know right. and and you're gonna see how many other women around the world has the same question as you and has the same fears as you and wants the same solutions as you so yeah, don't don't be afraid to do that because if you start, you could help your daughters to be more safe aware and your cousin and your sister and your mother, you know. So this is gonna help to be more stronger. And so yeah, I, I am really, really pushing for, for this because I wanna see a good a change in the world for women and for whoever, you know, wants to have a better place right. for change. Maybe fighting the denial can help them face reality about um, reproductive health, contraception, yes. or even safe sex, right? Yes, 100%. Yeah. So they, sometimes they say that uh, their Catholicism is the source of the conflict. You come from the place where Catholicism was born. Do you experience such conflicts with religion? Um, I mean, I believe in God a lot but I never go to church. I feel that any single situation that puts you rules is not right, like into expressing who you are. So just the way that I cannot get into a church with a skirt, like it doesn't make me want to go there. Like I can pray in my home every day and be a kind person and you know do the things that I've done in my life and sacrificing myself and keep wearing high heels, you know? So I wanna be me first. And when you know who you are, then you're able to achieve everything you want in life. So I feel that that's my religion, let's say. <laughs> it's very well said. Also, uh, we know that change in the way men treat women starts when the boys are very young. And I often tell my friends, female friends with sons, that the power to change a whole generation of thinking for men starts with the way they are raised. If you had yes. a son, how would you raise your son and how would you teach him about how to treat women? I, I, I really wish I will have boys <laughs> whenever I'm going to have them. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to teach because I want men to be men. That's under percent. But like the teaching of the respect that you have to give towards women, that's like absolutely something that first of all for me is, um, is very charming because when a man knows how to treat a woman, it's super attractive for me. And, uh, and, and also like making them understand that their mother is a woman. Like if they don't treat well their, you know, female around them, like how they could respect their own mother, you know? So I feel that, yeah, there must be something that people should teach at school as well, because maybe some parents has a very close-minded way of, you know, like seeing the world. And and I really hope that it would be built a course around it or they would, you know, right. they understand, like don't make men ashamed of giving flowers to women or, you know, like, giving their feelings out and yeah, like to, to be gentlemen again, <laughs> because that's missing in this, in this world right now. Like we yeah. need more gentlemen. Maybe you can teach that course. How not yeah, let's say that I'm, I'm working on a, on, a, on a very big project right now oh, um, to try to, yeah, use my story to teach different things. So I'm with a group of, of young, um, like me, like young um, guys and a girl right. um, trying to develop these, these things that hopefully is gonna be uh, put everywhere one day because I really want to teach in school what, 
you know, to do in situation has happened with me. And of course, about all of this matter that we just talked about has sex positivity and, and, and other informations, especially on domestic violence and how to handle these cases and, and other things. So right. let's see I, how it goes. I'll let you know when it's done. <laughs> yes, please. And I read somewhere that you also uh, spoke out about when sometimes women take me too too far and sometimes they use it to destroy a man's guess, life yeah. you want to say something about that yeah no i i had i used to have a podcast and i interviewed this person that lost everything he had because um of a situation that was a little ambiguous um yeah i feel that justice on this matter should be done in the moment that a lot of women, a lot of people are involved. Um, you should not destroy someone's life just because, I don't know, you wanna get back to an ex or something like that. Like that's not right. And yeah, I, I really feel bad for, for when things happen this way because I have a brother and I would never want him to go through something like that. I think that in time, there will be more equilibrium into this matter because, of course, right now Me Too is new, and and we need to understand how it works. So, yeah, like I, I hope that it's not gonna happen anymore like that. Like the people would just react right away when a woman says something. Of course, you need to have the right proof to speak and right. and all kind of things. So yeah. before destroying someone's life, of course. Right. You're also uh, maybe because you stayed in the Philippines, did you feel the need to give back because you were involved with a group called Humanility, which helped street children? Yeah. No, I I always always believed that the change starts with the young generations. I think that when you give opportunities to youth is when you make a better world. And that's my goal in life. I would love to see a better world happening. And when you give the opportunities to children, that's when it's gonna happen. Because of course, like, I see how these kids that had nothing when they start going to school and really get an education and everything, they want to achieve even more and help other people and you know feeling really like blessed to have uh, changed in their life is something that amazed me so yeah i feel that if ever you want to help someone uh start with children's because they're gonna really make a change they're gonna be the next generation in this world and so you have to put put out like a, a good example with growing up a um, good future men and women that knows how to be good and to share good. So wow. that's why I'm very passionate about helping kids. So yeah. many ways that you're changing the world. When you look back on all the things you went through from growing up with domestic violence to Berlusconi to Harvey Weinstein, when you look back and think about all these terrible things and all the good things that came out of it, how do you feel and what have you realized about your life? That I'm, I'm really blessed that I feel that all these things happened to teach me something and I'm really, really glad it happened because like I'm able to now share it and make people understand how to save themselves. And yeah, and, and the fact that I survived it and I had a second possibility in life it's yeah what really gives me hope that everything can be good at the end like there is nothing bad that happened for bad everything at the end happened for for something good so right. I have this this type of belief and and I'm gonna go keep fighting yes and, and, and that, see anyone or anything can stop you <laughs> Ambra thank yeah. you so much for spending time with Thank us. You. I'm sure that just by hearing you speak your mind and heart today, your courage and fighting for the truth and our rights 
has already rubbed off on all of us. As you have said, the truth speaks very loud and it cannot be buried. And I love how you describe yourself on social media. Filipino Italian breaking down barriers for others. For others. <laughs> Please continue to do so, and we hope you never stop. Brava, Ambra. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for much. giving me time <laughs> for and talking. Good morning and over there. <laughs> Thank you. Good night from for you. And thank you everybody that watched. Hopefully it was you. good. Good night from Manila. And this has been TikTok. Thank you for joining us.